miserable. You know, I really didn't. I really didn't like where we lived. We lived in Anaheim. I wasn't. I didn't feel like a connection to what was anything really. So I remember I was just training all the time. Mm. I trained a lot. I was even just talking to somebody a couple of days ago. I said, man, think about it. When I used to live, you know, that that era too of LA, like we used to drive anywhere and everywhere. The reason I know LA the way I do is because we would go to Pomona to break. We would go to Chino to break. We would go to um, we would go to Claremont Mesa to break. Mm. We would go everywhere and break. So really, nothing. No, nothing was too far. Like. We didn't really go to, we went to San Francisco. I, my father lived there, so we used to go there too. But I mean, you know, on the regular, we used to frequent all these places, you know. That's just what we did. That's how, we, if you were breaking back then, it was a big deal. The scene was large. You used to, people just traveled around and we went to practices all over the city, you know, all over the county, really. So yes. That was cool. It really was. I remember that though too, because I used to come with the guys from Madeira, mm -hmm. just to come to LA, just to come to go break, to go to Hope or something exactly. like that. Hope in Hollywood. And then like drive back the same day, and I knew it was insane because I'm coming like almost 300 miles, but you're right. Yeah, we used to, it was no big deal. I mean, so there was a set free, set free was a or, uh, like a church sponsored organization, more like um, bikers and just everyday people, like a lot of good folks. And Easy Rock was part of that. And so they had a practice again in Orange County. And I think it was, I don't know, it was Buena Park. I remember what the space looked like, but I don't remember the exact location. But mm. so that was a, a practice. And then they moved to LA and they set up on the corner of like Hollywood and Vine. And that okay. building right there. And that was, that was when the black and white checkered floor, that was that black and white checkered floor. Radiotron also had a black and white checkered floor, but that set free, they had a black and white checkered floor on the floor, and that, we used to always break in there. Um, it was a really a popular spot. And then fast forward, you know, years later, would be Hope in Hollywood. Mm. Over off of, you know, what is that, like Argyle and... Um, something like that, yeah. Vine or something over there, so. And that was a great spot, too, because that really was, you know, that spot was amazing. You know, we used to eat dinner, you know, that was how we met Havoc Coro, some of those dudes, Marlon and them, mm. they were living there. Um, you know, they were doing good work. And then, of course, a Homeland, you know. Um, homeland was the spot, though, too. I don't know if it was called Homeland back then, but it was always it was Park Homeland. Park. It was Homeland. Yeah. I mean, we've been, I mean that's, that's been around, like. 98. Yeah, that's been around a lot. So, 98. So, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, we've been practicing now forever, it seems like. Yeah. Um. You know, and then of course newer spots were Juice when they were at the the one church on like Sixth and Vermont. Something like there, that. They yeah. Were there, that was that spot, and then of course now they're over here, Arthur Park. So I think these practices are so important. It's, it's our social spaces. It gives us, you know, a place to do what we do. And it to, wasn't really practice spots. I don't really know if we'd be doing this. You know. I know what you're saying though too. Yeah. Okay. Um, Asia, like. I want to ask you, like, when you think of Mikey Ice, like, what is your, what's your thought and opinion about me as a, just overall? Because a lot of people, when they see, when they hear the name Mikey Ice, they think that's the guy with all the footage, which I am. <laughs> I've been collecting. Archivist. Yeah, like, dummy footage, though. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. But me and you, our history, we go back, like, 25 years. It's been a long time. So, yeah, so that's my question to you, like, well, you know, you've been there, you're around, um, you're breaking, you start rocking a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, I, I, I remember you more from, not Modesto, but I, I, can, I kind of remember you more from the Bay Area, you know what I mean? Like, coming from over there, um, and... I don't exactly know. I know you always have family here, so... Yes, I was born here. Yeah, you were from out here, so you were always... Always here all the time. You were always here, yeah. So, I don't I don't know. I mean, for me, it's hard for me to remember where exactly where everybody was from. Mm -hmm. But, um, 
I mean, you were just a part of the scene. You were, you were one of us. We were all. This is this is what we were doing. Um, you know, some some good, some bad. You know, there was years that things were copacetic. There was years that maybe it wasn't so copacetic. Mm -hmm. That 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 there. You know, when you go into those realms, it's it's hard because. People have beef certain years, certain years they didn't, you know. That's how breaking is. It's just how it is, man. I mean, so there was years that I think that we were more friendly. There was years it wasn't as friendly. But I don't, I don't exactly really, I don't identify like any real static or like intense no. drama. But hip hop was, you know, it was just like that. And we were always learning and proving ourselves. And the show improved, you know what I mean? Like such a big part of it. So, uh. I mean, you've always been here, and you've always you have been documenting for quite some time. Yeah. So you probably do have amazing archive footage. Yeah, like I said, since like last interview we did was like '96. Yeah. And it's it's crazy, you know, because like thinking about that time and where we're at today. Yeah. It just like um, it just makes me like, it makes me feel proud though, you know, and um, I wanted to show you this though, like. Yo, did I give you this? No, I actually had got that from, um, somebody had sent that to me from New York, like, back in 90, like, 97. Okay. But I have met you. There's certain folks I have with, with that same, I just wanted to show you that medallion, though, you know, so, um, I know it's, I know it, it's special, though, because the way that you talk about Zulu is the way that I felt about Zulu, you know, and I remember when I always seen you. Like you got me excited for Zulu. That's the reason why. Like I wanted to wear the medallion. I started wearing two medallions, three medallions. Look, I mean, look the thing is, is that with Zulu, you know, hip hop. What differentiates hip hop from things like jazz and other American art forms is, is that hip hop became a real movement not only around social justice, but it became an actual movement that had ethics and values and, and, and wisdom and information that was being passed around. And, and I think that like, you can't, that's why you can never really trivialize hip hop ever, because even if it, even without the art forms, like if you actually look at hip hop, from a standpoint of what Zulu Nation did, becoming the first organized real social yes. benefit organization um, in that era, like it's so important. You know, it's really, really important. It's really like a connection to the history of Black and Brown people in this country. You know, coming out of everything, from civil rights to Black Panthers to Zulu Nation. That's what I remember about it, Asia. When I was, yeah, when I really think about Zulu, it blew my mind because first time I went to the B-Boy Summit, it was me, Vietnam, and Flexum. And Flexum, yeah, Vietnam and Flexum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're walking up to the summit. You know, I have my Zulu necklace on, and I'm looking around. I don't know where the summit. I don't know where Balboa Park. We're coming from Madera Merced. Yes, Merced. Yeah. So we're walking, and I hear. What's the name of this nation? And I would hear, Sulu, Sulu. And I was looking around and I seen DJ Lacey. And he was like, hey man, what's up? I said, who are you? He said, I'm DJ Lacey from the UK. I said, what? I said, you got the same necklace I got on. That was the first time I knew that Zulu was more than color. Right, right. Well, that was, you know, that was the real, one of the real values that what Zulu really espoused and taught many of us is, is that hip hop and the root comes from black and brown. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of this knowledge that we were not privy to based on our educational system was introduced to us through the nation. And um, even things like principles of diet. A lot of what we get, a lot of our teachings and understandings about the world and science, where they actually really come from, a lot of these original cultures. So we were learning things, and, and especially too, that not only was it about complete upliftment of black people, mm. but it was really that if you're not black, you gotta get on board with this mission. Mm. If you're not black, 
especially at that time, it wasn't really just like a free for all. You know, kind of how it is now. Like, okay. Like, it, it wasn't, I wouldn't call it inclusive. I would call it exclusive. Yes, it was. You know, it was exclusive. You could go ahead, you might try to break, you might try to um, write graffiti or do anything, but unless you're really good, and, and this concept of down by law to, you know, this kind of idea of, of you, you know, you were that official mm. through your pedigree, either your lineage of your family in this, your crew, or how dope your skills were, you really were considered like a part of it, you know what I mean? You were just, you were just like, it was just like something you like to do. But to actually be a part of it, you really had to have some kind of pedigree too. And that actually came, that understanding came from this idea of the crew lineages. Mm -hmm. And, and that the, the lineages of different styles, whether it's graffiti, whether it's um, different styles within our dance, really came from these different groups, right? Mm -hmm. And so our understanding of that comes from our study, it comes from our practice, all of that. And then we manifest into what we do, right, in our own way. So that was really how all these styles got implanted and, um, and went from the East Coast to the West Coast, right? Mm -hmm. or, or vice versa when it comes to like pop and rock and things like that. So, so, you know, you had to be really good. And if you weren't black, you had to be extra good because you weren't just welcome. Come on, it really wasn't that. It was really, again, um, just like the music espouses at that time, a lot of the five percent nation teaches mm -hmm. really a culture for, for the black man and woman, you know, and, yep. and then uh, the brown people too because of the Boricuas and right. you know the Dominicans in New York, which you know obviously when you come to the West Coast, that that translates to Latinos over here, you mm -hmm. know, indigenous people over here. But you know, as far as Asians, as far as whites, it wasn't really like you know it was something we worked hard at to be accepted. It wasn't really easy because easy, I remember like in the early 90s, there wasn't as many. The Asian community wasn't really that big yet. Right. I mean, in the Bay, you had a lot of, uh, you know, Filipinos were always the ones. And even even in even in L.A., for sure, Filipinos, big time. Um, um, you know, which, yeah, not the other Asian groups. Yeah. Not. I mean, of course, when you look at the world, I mean, when, when they did that Zulu tour and they went to Japan, yeah, that changed the game over there for sure. And then Japan's mm -hmm. history really started from that point on. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it was. So a lot of people today just, you know, accept that it's like this really ultra-inclusive thing and culture. And, you know, I think there's some good and some bad in that. I think it's good because it, it, it allows people to feel part of something which everybody needs to, you know, which is why people join gangs to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. you know, have protection, if you're part of something, if you're brotherhood and sisterhood. But on the flip side, like, without it being earned, without it being, um, without feeling like you have to rise to a certain standard, that to me is why you got this battle scene the way we have it. Because, you know, if we if we took everything today and we threw it back into those early 90s period or whatever, you would never have these battles like this. Because not just anybody would be able to enter. Mm. You would have to basically have your... You know, you have to have your pedigree intact or started to even jump, even like, you know, sign up because you'd have to be asked, right? Mm, yeah. So I think that to me has really like, I don't know, man, it's taken it, it's, for me, it's taken that part of the joy away from it for me because I don't really attend a lot of those type of things mm. because I don't want to sit through all that. I don't want to, it's, our, our culture isn't like this sit back and look at you culture. It's not like that. No. It's an active culture. And so when you have to sit through 200, 400 people entering some battle, you start wondering like, hey, what is, <laughs> what's the purpose of this? Yeah. What are we doing? You know, where, where, where are we going with this? You know, so... What's great is with everything, like, because the scene has become so much like this, now you're seeing sort of like this um, desire and this revival, so to speak, of real jams and this idea mm. of, like, letting things sprout off naturally and, you know, how important the DJ is and really the point of the DJ, you know, mm. and, like, don't just assume that you just hire all these same DJs you can hear spinning because really... I very rarely go to a jam 
where I feel like the DJs are really deep. When you know what they're playing, to me, it's already missed the mark. We used to never know what they were playing. That's what I loved what about is that it. Song? Oh, because the way that they would put it together and the way their sets would be would be like you would recognize some of it, but it wasn't like you knew every song. And mm. you didn't know it wasn't that self gratification like, oh, play all the songs I like, make sure you play everything you know we want to hear. Yeah. And that's kind of killed the, the ability for us to be able to freestyle what we do. Mm. Because really, when you get to a point that you, you've really got these movements, you're supposed to just freestyle, right? Mm -hmm. Just to the music that you're hearing. But if the music that you're hearing is very um, just pre formatted, based on what we dance to, so to speak, then it becomes like our approach isn't really ever free in what we do, you know? That's so, true. So I think that, you know, I hope people pay more attention to what DJ really is. Mm -hmm. And it's not just playing like a selection of music, you know? And, and bringing people out that actually are real DJs that believe in body. That's why when we bring people out for Summit, we try to expose people Mm. Like a Jazzy J or something. Like right. Like the Grand Wizard Theater. You know, there's people, um, Grandmaster Kaz, and different people that, you know, they, they, I'll never forget one of the summers when we did it at, uh, in Hollywood at, um, the Vanguard. I think it was 2000. 2003? I think it was 2004. 2004. But, um, there was, um, I remember that Kaz was playing um, the Shy Lights, uh, and um, the Beyonce sound. Mm. That's when that crazy love song came out. So it was whatever that. Dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. And everybody's like, "Why is he playing Beyonce?" Like people was mad. Oh. He wasn't playing Beyonce, you know? Right. That's because they didn't know. He was just. Da, 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 da. And he was just, you know. Because that was the break. Uh, 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 you know uh, what I mean? Uh, uh, like, she took that part, but that was the break of it. Mm -hmm. So we were just, you know, I was just amazed at people's um, the comments I was hearing. Mm. Maybe just a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding. And that's what we're supposed to do as hip-hop, you know, heads. We're supposed to teach. We're supposed to always be um, trying to innovate and, and, you know, continue, like, the cypher, right? Yes. So, you know, I just, I think that's what we're supposed to do. Even fast forward 2020, right? Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, if you could go back and look at the younger Asia, ver Asia one of you, though, like, what would you change? Because I know even, like, now looking back, I made a lot of mistakes. Right. I made a lot of mistakes. There was time where my boss was like, I said, I'm going to the summit because the pre-party was on Friday. Right. I wasn't even going to work. And I didn't go to work. And they didn't give it to you off. So you they didn't give it to us. So I made that sacrifice either it was going to be my job right. or there's a b-boy event. Since I was so b-boy, it naturally said b-boy. Right. And you like when you came home, you had to probably find another job. And that's hard. But you know what, my boss, I think they kind of got the hint that, you know, that I was a b-boy. Right. So and I've been there for such a long time. Right. Like they basically I had seniority like to keep that's my good. job, you know. So um, if you can give any like what like if you can change anything like looking back. You know, like knowing like where we're at in 2020, like, like what what is some things that you look back on and you just like, you know what? I was young and I, I know like I shouldn't have really done that. Hmm. Um, well, I never. Is trust I one never, of them? I, what? Trust. Trust. Like trusting people. I never, I'll say this for myself. Really. Okay. I never threw anybody out of the house. I can still hold my head up and say I never, I never really, I didn't ever do anybody dirty, dirty. Like, maybe, you know, if you got a story, you can go ahead and tell me. But your story might be a little bit more edified in your own mind in terms of, like, mm -hmm. what happened. Or, or maybe it impacted you. I didn't say hi to you. Or, yes. You know, whatever. I recently had somebody get mad at me because they were like, Yo, you, it was somebody I hired to judge for mm. Summit, and they got there really, really late, so I had to replace it, right? Oh, yeah. And then, so they're mad at me because when they showed up, 
they said that I didn't ask how they were and stuff. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I didn't, I wasn't like, and you know, I apologized to the person. I said, y'all, I'm sorry. Mm. My mind was definitely on other things at that point. I'm sorry I didn't ask if he was all right, how you were doing, how you some water, you know. Maybe I would handle it differently, right? Mm. So I think that's the only thing is you, okay. as you mature, you handle things differently. Um, Differently, I guess there was one year where I, man, I lost 25 G's because of a, because of a situation, and um, mm -hmm. I had to, after that I had to basically give up everything I had mm -hmm. and and start all over again. Today. Yeah, and that that's tough. Because I think in a business schematics, I wouldn't have put that kind of money. Yeah. Been like, no. I'll just cut this day off. Mm, makes um, sense. It was actually the, um, the idea to bring out the early strutters from the bay. Oh, really? Yeah. And do that that day. And it really, I really wasn't that happy with how that whole day turned out. Mm. Um, but I didn't want to disappoint them. By, because this was the first time anybody had really invested in them and said, Yo, we're going to bring you all you guys out, eight, nine groups. Granny and the Bogey Choice, mm. Peace, um, all these early, early groups. Um, and also the person that was coordinated was Pop Tart, and I didn't want to let him down either. Okay. And when I had lost the funding for that day because our sponsor pulled out two weeks before, I should have just. No, I'm sorry, they pulled out two months before. Mm. But I should have I should have cut that day. Okay. $25,000 situation. It was because um, there's so many groups and it was just a transportation thing and the venue cost. You know, back then stuff still cost a lot. So um, I would say that was really hard because I, I kind of spiraled down after that for several years because it was just my choice, you know. Yeah. But um, I don't know, man. I, I don't I don't know. I don't really. I, don't, I can't feel like I would do that much different, really. You know. Okay. Really so you've been the whole time like this under the. I'm pretty happy with. It. Right. So the I mean, whole. Like, Win, lose, or draw, you know? It's, it's been an amazing road, you know? I've had a lot of people do me dirty and throw me under the bus, so to speak. Mm -hmm. but I never held a grudge. Mm -hmm. I was always able to, I, I give that to God. Right. Because he dwelled me with that. That if he's going to forgive me, that I have to forgive other people all the time. Right. How many times? Seven times 70. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I don't, anybody out there right now holding on to, to grudges or trespasses that other people think other people trespass against you, I really encourage you to let it go and actually go be the first person to be like, yo, I'm willing to let this go. Mm -hmm. Let's piece this out when we're going, right? Right. People die all the time. You never know when it's your time to meet your maker. So, mm, strong message. You know what I'm saying? There's no reason. I don't care what nobody did to you. Like, it's, it's, it's all just because of like, sometimes they said that you said something about them. They heard two or three different people. Right, right, right. They never really physically heard you say it. Right. But somebody said that. He said that they said right. that you said I was a biter. There was so much stuff like that back then. <laughs> like, it was ridiculous. There was so much, you know, just traviesa. Just all this crap going on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. But I wouldn't, I really don't. I don't have anything to really say on that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Makes sense. So, um, thank you for the, um, honestly, the yeah, very right, super right. educational video. Anytime. I've learned a lot of things about you that I never knew. And that was the purpose, though, too, is as long as I've known you, I didn't know these stories about Colorado and, and Gremlin. I, I've read about Gremlin when he showed up. When I seen yeah, Grimm's... Yeah, really cool... Yo, um, there's, a, there's a documentary that you can, you can get online. You have to buy it, but it's worth, it's worth it, you know? Um, it is... It's called Souls of the Rockies with a Z, mm. S-O-L-Z of the Rockies.